Hey. Yeah. Thanks a bunch for that apple. It's going to pay dividends over the course of this episode. You know what they say, an apple a day uh, is not good enough because your catabolic window is closing and you need to get uh, 44 grams per inch of muscle uh, into your body. Of protein. (laughs) And that was the fitness minute. Second. Yeah, Yeah, that's over. All right. um, Obviously, you want... Well, okay. Well, here, let's do the the life minute uh, as well. I don't know. I'm getting a retainer, a new retainer because we... I found my old one in the parking lot the morning after in full pancake. Oh wow! Yeah, I just I, so it dropped out of my pocket. Your nighttime oral retainer was squashed. Well, I mean, you say nighttime, but like, there's no reason you can't wear that twenty four seven under, especially if you're like wearing a mask for work. Wow, Bailey you know, of all people being in the hospital, she should be rocking that retainer like all the time, unless she has like a lisp and it affects her like communication. You wouldn't want a patient dying on you because you couldn't say, like, themethicone. <laughs> very true. You're totally the person who would be very diligent about their retainer usage. Uh, until until it's like, oh, geez, I'm literally, like, a skeleton because I'm not eating enough because I got to take it out of my, like, it, it definitely affects your appetite. And so I'm like, well, what? now I got, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Well, yeah. I mean, I'm just, it, it's such a pain to like take out and put back in your, like, especially if you're like grab and go as I am. And so, yeah, uh, despite my uh, diligence that you so appropriately lauded, I'm totally just shoving that thing in my pocket because I left the case in my jacket and it was raining. Like, all manner of circumstances are like, oh, now I'm wearing cargo pants. Oops, I left them in those cargo pants. So it's like, and I'm just like, oh, I'm, I'm, dying of hunger because i i work so often uh i'll just not wear it uh oh but now i feel bad for not wearing it okay i'll, I'll bring it and then that's how it like falls out of my pocket ends up in the parking lot of oh, ford f-150 rolls onto it and a hashtag not sponsored but uh yeah now i'm getting a new one well you'll cringe at the thought that i abandoned wearing my retainer that's what bailey did in 2020 yeah. i gave it up what do you not like being attractive yeah, I hate it. It's too much, too easy. I too need to easy. handicap myself <laughs> somehow. Literally. Otherwise, life is just dull and boring. Yeah, yeah. You, wait, you, wait. You make your bed more often than you. Well, what am I? What am I trying to say? I'm just trying to like line up the idiosyncrasies. You currently you have a retainer. I do. I've had it many years. It got kind of gross. Yeah. So I guess I just reached the point That's when you just where put, I you dump in some ammonia and then you dump in some bleach and it's good as new. I've, don't do wait, I, don't, <laughs> don't, don't let me clear. Not those two ingredients. Don't, yeah, don't roll through that non sequitur. People listening, don't. That's the recipe for mustard gas, people. I, that was the joke. <laughs> do not do that. Oh man. This is my I am I am not legally liable, your honor. Who's listening to this recording? <laughs> yeah, so I, I haven't worn one in two years, but... Shame. Shame. I'll take it. I'm going through the, the motions just to... Anyway, so that's that's the, all that's new in my life. Okay, cool. I guess while we're talking nonsense, I'll do some video game adjacent nonsense. For many years, I've heard people say, you know, they just can't get into PC gaming because they like to recline from the comfort of their couch. And now, oh, now, finally, to prove all the naysayers wrong, I have gone to some ridiculous lengths to hook my PC up to a TV I just purchased. Made my first TV television purchase of my entire life. It's big. I've got a couch. And I am now determined, no matter how many hoops I have to jump through, to plug my gaming rig into it. That involved purchasing the most expensive cable I've ever seen. I got an HDMI 2.1 cable, Heath. It's 50 feet long. How much do you think that charged me? Uh, okay, just just for the viewers at home, why doesn't Chris put his computer right next to the big family room TV? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because you work off of it in your in your office space? Yeah, I want I want a distinct dividing line between my office and my... Oh, living room. You also listened to that uh, C- CGP Gray video. Oh, is that like tips from working from home yeah. kind of thing? Yeah, he did. I like that channel. Yeah, I like him. 
And I haven't seen that video, but so I this, understand where he's coming from. So this HDMI cable is just running across your kitchen, right? Yep. I got okay. some uh, command hooks. Uh, it's running across my ceiling. You need a raceway. What is a raceway? A raceway. It's, uh, it's everybody's favorite commercial grade uh, uh, electrical uh, cable management. Uh, oh, yeah. Just yeah. Like, just like a little, you know, just. That would. Just cheat it through the thing. That would look very professional. Just cheat it right through. Yeah. I'll um, do it. I have a much more uh, impromptu solution right now. <laughs> But yes, I'm yeah. stringing 50 yeah. feet. For people listening at home, just Google like favela electricity. <laughs> and, and that's Chris's home. That's Chris's <laughs> apartment. It looks a little nicer than that, but it's this is <laughs> oh Chris's my gosh. apartment. <laughs> Talk about cable management Woo! nightmare fuel. Woo! But how much did your HDMI 2.1 yep. ESPN cost you? Yeah, how much do you think 50 <sighs> feet of high fidelity cabling cost? Well, wait, it's just an HDMI cable. You're not but losing any latency through it. The, the latest standards, 2.1, those aren't your everyday run-of-the-mill HDMI yeah, cable. Yeah, but why do you seat. need to buy... What, what, is the, what does that Because get I you? want my sweet 4K resolution at frame rates higher than 60. Oh... That's oh, and, what I want this cable for. And the for. HDMI cable that's bringing my, the, my laptop signal to this monitor... Would probably cap at 60 frames per second. Uh, it, were you to broadcast at that's 4K fine. resolution. That's Wait, that's so fine. It's fine until you become a performance snob like myself. And you can never go back. Well, okay, without looking it up, um, a 50-footer is going to be like... Maybe like twenty two dollars, but it with at this highest spec, maybe like maybe just like a full fifty dollars. Yeah, well, Amazon was running a sale, so I got a steal just shy of eighty dollars. Chris, yep, Chris, you, I bought it. I bought an HDMI cable for eighty bucks, sh- and and the results speak for themselves. Oh, that's the best part. <laughs> you haven't even gotten it out of the packaging. Oh no, I've I've connected everything. Okay. I don't have a graphics card that is HDMI 2.1 compatible. What you have a you have an RTX something? I do not. Oh yeah. Okay. Remember? Well, yeah. Remember yeah. the past two years that yeah. happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, I, you'd be, the, I'd be the first to know if you got one. Yeah. Um, but uh, September 20th, so Jensen will be coming on stream, Nvidia CEO, announcing the 4000 series. So I'm hopping on, no matter what it takes this time. I've got two years of pent up aggression, uh-huh. not being able to buy an Nvidia graphics card. You are you are your bots at the ready? Uh, no, but I'm willing to kowtow to any and all scalpers. Wh- that's exact. Wait, this all right? <laughs> PSA number two: Don't listen to the Chris. <laughs> Scalping never works. But. But everything, the stars have aligned, Heath. Everything is in my favor. Um, GPU prices are crashing. You see that Ethereum news where there has been a paradigm shift from proof of work to proof of stake, which is a very big change in the world of cryptocurrency where it's now not very affordable to mine with a high-end graphics card. Um, So basically, crypto miners don't care about these new GPUs way less than they did last time. The factors are looking very favorable for the capital G gamers to get some computer graphics card hardware this time. Well, that's good. Yeah. Right. Capital G gamers are our, our uh, uh, countrymen. Our bread and butter. Yeah. Very cool. You know what you want next in the uh, in the video delivery department? Terra deck. Um, antenna? array yeah one of these guys so then you don't have to string uh your uh, very expensive cable across your kitchen you just set this bad boy up at your pc oh. and then you put a receiver or no 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 there's a you put a transmitter on your pc and then you put this big square dish let me just i want to get you for scale on on set you put this next to your TV. Oh, it's killing me. Well, there's the transmitter. And that way uh you get the you get the best signal. I see. 
All right. Well, enough about me buying overpriced cords and willing to pay scalper prices on new hardware. Um, wait, so wait, you're going to play PC games on your big family room TV? I am, yeah. Where's the keyboard going to go? I'm going to only play controller games. <laughs> All right. Should I play anything that's... Oh, then you um, just retreat. Yeah, if I want to play any grand strategy, whatever, Total War games. But that's mixing your entertainment and your workspaces. And I've been doing that for the past eight years, and it's been, I've enjoyed myself. But anyway, we should probably announce the name of this show. What? Yeah. What are we? What are we talking into? This is Mobius Tubes, a video gaming podcast. Episode seventy-five, being recorded on September eighteenth, twenty twenty-two. We're back. We're better than ever. That's um, enough initial rambling and life updates. Oh, you think so? I. I'll hit you with a surprise right here, right now, Heath. This is a short, possibly recurring segment I like to call, What Has Dan Been Playing? All right, you don't know what's coming right now, but... (laughs) I don't. um, Noted friend of the podcast and occasional listener, a mutual friend of ours, Dan. Hey, Dan. He dropped a little bomb on me last night. There we were, halfway through our electrifying game of Power Grid at board game night. Uh Uh-huh. And we took our standard cookie break, yep. and Dan uh, let it be known that he's a uh, recent PS5 owner. Yay! Dan bought a PS5 from uh, Target, apparently. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's a big deal, especially for Dan. Known. He hasn't owned a console n- since. Known, not prolific gamer Dan right. hasn't owned a console since his Xbox 360, he said. Since the Need for Speed golden years of 2008. So he just missed the whole uh, PS4, Xbox One generation, but he's back with the PS5, and I'm like, oh man, what have you been playing, Dan? To which he said... God um, of War. His console came bundled with uh, Horizon Forbidden West. Oh, weird. And he's been playing it, and here's Dan's impressions. He said... It did a good job catching him up to speed, not having played the first game. And also, and I quote, I liked it a lot more than I thought I would. Oh. And Dan, a, a man a man of relatively few words, I think that was a ringing endorsement from Dan. So, uh, yeah. Horizon Forbidden West. Well, Better now, than Dan thought it would be. <laughs> it, and that's a PS, that's a PlayStation exclusive. It is. So yeah. I'm not going to play it unless I... Sneak into Dan's home and, right, and yeah. grab a hold of his haptic. Wait, what's the what type of controller is a PS5 use? A, a dual sense? Dual sense, yeah. Ah, you think that was partly uh influenced his uh purchase decision? Um, I think he said he was interested in pl- playing some MLB the show games. Yeah, that's, oh that's only PlayStation except for those that uh, went cross platform. <laughs> except for the ones that aren't, yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that that was um, a possibly a recurring segment. What has Dan been playing? Yay! Oh, I like this segment. Yeah, I didn't. I'm I'm here for it. If if you're listening, Dan, I hope you appreciate that. Speaking of games that we played on the big T, biggest screen in our respective residencies. Yes. Uh, I sent you that video about the Outer Wilds. Yeah. I've been I've been playing Outer I own echoes of the eye now okay and i started a new expedition so we're jumping into a conversation about podcast noted podcast favorite game um outer wilds and heath has touched the dlc for the very first time i haven't even i haven't even brushed the dlc okay i'm still playing through the base game trying to get my sea legs because need i remind you chris and uh, and the video was uh that Hinted upon the particular topic, I am scared of space. Yeah. This could be inferred from my earliest planetarium visits at the <laughs> Rochester Museum and Science Center. Sure. Walking into the, what's the name of the big uh, star projection thing in the center? Oh. What's the, it, they gave it an affectionate name. It does name. have a fun name. Or maybe that, like, in that since got retired and then they added a new name. At one point in time, I knew this trivia, but yeah. no longer. Maybe I'm it starts afraid. with like an H. It, I was going to say it starts with an H. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, I always clung to 
whoever I was n- walking next to as we walked into the planetarium because losing depth perception above me makes me want to crawl under a rock. Very interesting. Like the like the un, like the insect I am. It's kind of like inverse fear of heights. It's the 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 wide expanse above you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, I don't get this in a field. Right. Cuz I'm like that's, I'm just outside. I've been familiar. habituated to yeah. it so much. Uh man, even just like uh going into the tutorial on timber hearth where it's like oh you need to fix this satellite which is just a machine at the center of the earth and you go down the elevator and you see like it and man outer wilds is the best game ever made it's pretty incredible and this is the 2019 space exploration puzzly game where you explore a miniature a uh, solar system, little little, little sandbox, and in, in uh, it stretches as far as the uh, uh, solar system, uh, and the way that they tutorialize you is you have to go down to the the center because you you you're a little you're a little denizen of a, a very small planet, which for for a tu- like a tutorial island that's that's pretty good. You want to have a small area to to jump around in. Yeah. See Breath of the Wild. So you're this little alien freak who has to go down to the center of the Earth, and of course, at the center of, of the planet's core, there's no gravity. If it's like a hollow core, there would be no gravity. Because the mass of the planet is pulling on you equally from all 360 degrees of direction. Thank you, Chris. So you're weightless, effectively. Yeah. It should be known that this this game, the simulated physics are the premier simulation available in the video game genre. You can't really find a bet aside from like Kerbal Space Program. This is the most uh finely tuned physics simulation in video games ever. They went above and beyond. So it's the the, the weightlessness you experience when you're at the core of Timber Hearth isn't artificial it's not like you you crossed a threshold so the developers flipped off gravity it's because the massive objects are actually being simulated in real time that your character gradually becomes weightless your jetpack ascent as you rocket across the skyline will be affected by where the moon is in orbit around your earth yeah it's ridiculous infinitesimally small maybe but but still it's like wow they're doing it like how many phd physicists do you think they had on the development team well what's what's his face freaking mobius digital uh it's uh, we're just patting ourselves on the back to have the share the same namesake but uh, but yeah, when you go down into the tutorial cave to fix this thing, the way that they uh, they kind of like get you get your mind in the right headspace (pun intended) is that there's little little like uh, twinkly rocks down the elevator shaft that imitate the expanse of stars in the in on your horizon in space, and just that like homage like makes my skin crawl i i want to say though i i do get habituated to it and it's all it has to totally do with sea legs much in the way like if you're wearing a vr headset yeah you get used to it good Um, analogy just like when i first uh and i'm also playing this game okay so like what's the what's the goal right heath is trying to beat this dlc so we can do a spoiler cast i'm playing through the game I here's the problem with replayability of Outer Wilds. It has no replay value, uh, and so I'm just I'm I'm it's it's a playthrough, but it's also like a it's like a breadcrumb through. I'm not jumping ahead to places that I only would know how to access because I've seen the future. Like I'm I'm just I'm making this this open world sandbox puzzle playset into the most linear experience I could come up with from a gaming perspective. So I'm uh, I'm going to Giant Steep because that was the last place that like Gabro, the only guy that shares your time p- point of view. I go straight to him. I'm freaking out on out on on Giant Steep because it's the water planet. It's got big typhoons. I always assumed if they touched you, you died. Oh. 
And yeah. then and then little do you know, it's it's the coolest mechanic ever. So I'm I'm loving Outer Wilds. I've already put like three hours into it. I won't bore you with that with the non DLC information of which I like haven't seen. Is it gonna just show up in the base game or is it completely epilogue? So that's what I wanted to ask you. Have you have you noticed how to begin finding the DLC content at all? Is it the satellite that's orbit- orbiting like up- Timber Hearth? Uppy Downy? No, yeah. not Timber Hearth, but like. Oh, yeah. I've seen some changes. So when you zoom out of the solar system, there's all the planets that you recognize. And then there's like a. There's an orbit that's going up and down relative to the planet of the solar system that is. A satellite that's providing imagery? That's right. Um, that's the deal. I believe there's a new exhibit at the museum on Timber Hearth. I got that text okay. box. Very cool. So that's like the very first breadcrumb that begins to tell you how to access the DLC. Because, oh. because of course, Outer Wilds the best game ever. You don't load into the DLC in like a separate menu prompt. It's a puzzle just to access it. Yeah. It's a <laughs> whole adventure just to find where the new content is stored. Okay. Um, so I'm going to get back to it after this very episode. That's not true. I'm going to maybe... I, I already picked up Bailey's prescription and I already got some dish detergent. We're going powdered now. We're never doing the the little pouches again. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Because I've been watching too much Technology Connections. Uh oh. What? A, what? You know ailments? who Technology Connections is? I do not. He's like a he's like a Chris Doak looking guy. Okay. I'm gonna bleep that last name, but I'm just uh, he he's just way so verb. Not verbose, because he's definitely approachable, and he has the driest sense of humor with these huge pregnant pauses. Uh, he's he's great. He'll talk about the why why like flip clocks are charming in the way that they are, and talk about why uh, future homeowners should really invest in like a heat pump or like a geothermal heat system. Okay, that's a big deal. And then. Um, just, just tons of like mechanics and like why the U.S. electrical grid is stupid and why just why you shouldn't buy those little cascade po- like detergent pods because it's a waste of money. I see. Yeah. So now we're going straight powder. It's so. more economical to so pour it in. Aside from emptying the dishwasher, I'm gonna be going back into Outer Wilds. Unless you can persuade me over the course of this podcast to play plug in something different. Like if I really need to like not sleep on thirteen sentinels, I'll I'll issue my my out, out otherworldly exploration cravings. The only reason I would prioritize thirteen sentinels above Echoes of the Eye is uh the fear of you beginning to forget plot details. Mm, well, that was that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I mean these are both two game these are two of the my most anticipated spoiler casts with you. Yeah. I won't be choosy about which one you choose to do first. Which is your favorite child, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can find out which my which one is my favorite child if you go back to our top 10 games I played last year when I ranked them in numerical order. Oh, wow. That that's actually taxing my memory darn yeah <laughs> so there's an explicit answer to that question <laughs> okay very cool i should actually wait no i probably should drop everything and play 13 sentinels because while bailey's at work i won't have to deal with the embarrassment the shame <laughs> yeah of enjoying or just of consuming anime right yeah my friends can i shut the blinds <laughs> Aren't you? You're on like the second story. I, I the birds cannot know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. So that that is unfortunately all That's the outer. One wilds. of the space games I played this this uh, section. Closing the book on outer wilds for now. To be continued. What's next? Keith? A- across the other star system. Yes. I beat Mass Effect 1. Yeah. Let's get my notes out. Much to my surprise, you did. <laughs> what? You surprise? did uh, finish Mass Keith Effect. Keith finishing a video game? <laughs> what is this, what, Witcher? All right, what's your first question? I mean, 
Do you have any spoiler-free thoughts you can share up front? Oh, um, uh, yeah, you know, I, I, um, word to the wise, once you get in the final act of Mass Effect 1, it just, it just credits. <laughs> and I thought it would kick me out into the overworld, much like a Death Stranding, much like a more modern-y game. I uh, obviously, see. this is, just, you know. Should you choose to continue playing, you pick up right before the final mission, right? No, you pick up in the middle of the boss battle. Oh. If you I don't, hit continue... You don't have previous saves. I mean, I could load up a, an old save. I see. Okay. But then you got to beat the the thing again. Oh, man, that's pretty antiquated. Wait, so I'd have to, like, I'd have to load up an older save, finish all the side missions... Beat the final act, and then load that into Mass Effect Two. Because I already started Mass Effect Two. I already met. Uh, I'm gonna make up their names: Rachel and Derek. What? What? Miranda and who is the black guy? Jacob. Yeah, it is Jacob. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'm already. I'm already cruising into there. I'm already flirting with. Uh, what? What's that girl on the deck? Her name starts with a Y. Oh yeah, she didn't do nothing. But I, but Mass Effect is like, I I just called Commander Shepard Mass Effect. Mass Effect's like, uh, I'll I'll cradle your bosom basically, and she blushes, and it's like, oh, oh, yikes. Anyway, um, spoiler free notes about Mass Effect One. Oh wow, what a good good recommend, Chris. I enjoyed it. Um, don't sleep on the red and blue text. The white text might as well be n- meaningless when you see a red and a blue. You're talking about dialogue options, yeah. And how if you're you can you if you if the charm or intimidate options are available, those are the best ones to pick. It just the the other like like I forget what I because because truth be told, I chose a dialogue option on the on. Of the white variety, sure. Because I liked how it was written. Yeah, it was it was something I would say, and it ended up in the first death of a crewmate. Okay, <laughs> yeah. So let's but let's just y- jump right into it. You should. You see were that. you were trying. I was were, on for you were role playing. Yeah, and yeah. So in a kind of a gamey aspect of Mass Effect dialogue selection. You, the the more rewarding or beneficial options were the ones that are sometimes locked out from you which by are the, the charisma skill by check. the charisma skill check. It's like Disco Elysium. So although Disco Elysium kind of like warns you. Well, I wait. No, are there any? Sorry, you should finish what you're saying, and then I I'll, was just going I'll to say, say it's just like you said. If you want better outcomes, you're incentivized to choose the the harder to unlock options even if you like the writing of the neutral options yeah yeah i chose a vanilla option that some sucker would have had to have picked had they not had my juicy charisma of captain shepherd right or you... my evil par- renegade yeah option i had the renegade option was available oh wow okay but yeah, you, I told that line, you just Chris. neglected to capitalize on your Because I thought we were still like options. information gathering. Got it. You, okay. you often venture to the left side of the dialogue wheel to be like, tell me more about Blumpkins. <laughs> don't, don't look that up. <laughs> Got it. I chose the worst alien uh, <laughs> fake word that ends up being a real word. Um, yes. Yeah, so R.I.P. So we're, all right. All right, entering yeah. the Mass Effect spoilers. Shall zone. we? I mean, it's it's yeah. I'm I'm glad I played it because it, the subtext is already paying dividends in Mass Effect Two. Very cool. They already b- brought up like <laughs> what's the what's the AI's name on on the Normandy Two? Edie. Yeah, Edie. So I Com- Commander Shepard is being introduced to Edie by whoever. Like Miranda's like here, he, he, ca- uh, Commander. This is this is our artificial intelligence co-pilot after uh, freaking uh, Terry Perry Perry, 
Who is who is like the balding uh, sh- ship steward that bites the dust? Is it Navigator or Presley? Yeah, Presley. I said okay. Perry Presley. Uh, after yeah, after Presley gets like frozen in space. Spoiler. I kind of like this character. I hope he comes back as a as a pirate. <laughs> um, here's our artificial intelligence, not Cortana Edie, that's gonna help us navigate the uh, the the Cerberus side of the universe. <laughs> Uh, I I told I, I made Commander Shepard Shepard go fuck you it's to the AI bot and said get this off my ship and everyone's like whoa Commander Shepard what's what's wrong with you and then Miranda had to be like uh sorry Commander Shepard has some uh um uh prejudices against artificial intelligence after his. Uh, mission on the moon where he had to fight those the three rogue VI. the rogue VI three bases super slow combat um already like whoa yeah yeah dude I'm so jazzed like it picked those all it needed to do was just give me a morsel of that and, and I'm it, so happy it to do does it. these are some of the most intrinsically linked games there are where. You're a fool. It's if you almost don't. like this game is going to define your tastes. <laughs> Who can say? We'll have to stay tuned to, to find out. Let's spoil Mass Effect One. Uh, the the end end screen where it's like these are the choices that you made. There's only like six choices that mattered, and I was like, huh, how few? They'll find ways to sprinkle in smaller choices as like uh, as a, as some seasoning. Yeah, but. Yeah, like six big impactful ones. Yeah, who did you? Who did you? Which of your human compatriots did you leave behind on Vermeer? Right. So is this the only character death your squad suffered, or did you have more? I mean, I mean, I could have. I almost sent you a screenshot of Rex's cold body on the no, beach. No, dude. Yeah. yeah, like Rex, that's what I was getting at with the white text. That's that was the loss. Yeah, oh, dude. Man. Rex Rex up and died and I said rewind. And did you? Yeah. Okay. He's like the best character He's already. He's so cool. I have never completed a Mass Effect playthrough with a deceased Rex. Right. Okay. So, phew. Okay. For and those that- of those who have never played Mass Effect He's the he's the big fish monster guy that looks like he can bite me in one gulp, and he he's he's got some great uh, ethical dilemmas, especially with that genophage. Yes, judge judge genophage. Big personal issue for him and his people. Yeah, and you're. Yeah, so you're you have to talk him down. He's very distraught on Vermeer because you're about to potentially. Destroy research. We found the cure to space AIDS. Yeah. And yeah. it only plagues his species. Right. Because the CIA invented AIDS. <laughs> so so he's like... It was bio-warfare. Yeah, Sh- uh, Shepard, you gotta let me bring this back to my people. It could help the Krogan. And then Shepard basically, like, doesn't side with him, which always irritated me. I thought, like, it, you should be able to be like, Rex is right. We can't let this cure uh, disappear. Yeah, you're but, not but given that level of freedom. You can't because otherwise the Krogan would just wipe out. And I already know what like the genophage is an allegory for. Sure. Two things. It's the Tuskegee Airmen. Yeah. The historic where those pilots were tested for like all manner of, of viruses just it, the most exploitative thing the US government has ever done to like t- like civilians their own people they, they weren't even civilians they were just like just really yeah their own people so like the the analogy is that the krogan are these highly skilled things and uh and then the other the sorry the other allegory is is um the japanese in world war 2 where like had the Krogan been allowed to proliferate? Yes. Or the the Krogan Wars, right? Mm-hmm. Alliance Space is saying we could keep fighting the Krogan, but it would end up in the most bloodiest, highest casualtyest, worst combat in the galaxy. 
Or we could make it so that one in 1,000 births is viable. Right. They basically castrated the entire Krogan race. And I already know that there's a special companion in, in Mass Effect 2, Dr. Somebody, who who basically trademarked the genophage. Okay. Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, yeah that's exciting. Um, and so... Uh, I I didn't want to go against Rex, which is what led me to pick a white text when I needed to do a blue or a red. I see. And then Ashley, <laughs> straight up, <gasps> blam! And like even on the second load up, where I I talk to my human companions and I'm like, maybe I can like uh, get some more information before the lead up to this this do or die Mexican standoff. Yeah. And and in the second load up, you could signal Ashley to pop one in Rex. I didn't know it was Ashley who sh- shoots him. Yes. Okay, I've, yeah. I've never actually seen the scene occur. It's just it yeah, you know what I at, least, at first I thought it was like I thought it was scripted. Ah. I thought I thought like Saren a Saren Geth sniper hits Rex on the beach from the back and then like, oh, you have to compromise the cure to heal Rex and that would be some ethical funsies. But as soon as I saw Ashley, I was like, oh, this is a this is a fail state. <laughs> and yeah, but Rex ragdolls. It's, it's literally not a fail state. The game will continue. You will just continue to play three Mass Effect games without Rex being alive. Which is... Which is not the I I have enough foresight to to know. You ever see Wandavision? I have not. Okay, darn. Well, that analogy is a no go. Uh, anybody listening? The part where in the in episode one of Wandavision, where she just sees something that shouldn't be and goes no, and then <laughs> and then resets resets the episode. Gotcha. Yeah, you should watch that. Uh, because that's what I did to mess fit my playthrough. Yeah, is I brought Rex back, and then uh, and then yeah, we we led the the thing on Vermeer, and despite Ashley betraying my my squad in a previous life, I set. What a, do you mean by that? She she's the one that shot Rex. Oh, okay. In your in your alternate reality fail state that you reset right right right, okay. right 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 uh despite her being the one who did that i decided to rescue her from the fate that befalls one of your crewmates on vermeyer someone does not make it out yep rest so. in peace kaden is kaden alive in your for virgin playthrough kaden is very much dead in my virgin yeah. playthrough yeah well because, like, what was he good for? Like, tech? He just complains about his migraines <laughs> because of his his, his outdated um, implants. Oh, oh, that's how he got, like, a. that's how he's a human biotic. Right, yes. Oh, because um, he has a Motorola phone in his head. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> yeah, sorry, okay. Caden is just, he's never jived with me. Okay, well. Even though Ashley's a space racist. Yeah, I heard about that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Wait, yeah, explain that for the people. Oh, she's just very xenophobic against most alien races. Very human first. Yeah. Um, oh, and I didn't vouch for that candidate on the Citadel that was like, uh, re- remember something, humans first. Okay, yeah. I was like, I'm not endorsing you. I My best friends are aliens. Right, but when so, I encountered him on my uh, Renegade playthrough, we were we were chummy. You were like, yeah, humanity all the way. Yeah, all these all these fish monsters gotta go. Right. Mm. All right. Cool, cool. Uh, yeah, Vermeer's a very a big highlight of the game. Yeah. So that's that's Vermeer. Did I did I have anything to say about Saren? I kind how of about was hoping Sovereign? Ooh yeah, let's talk about sovereign. So sovereign is a is a reaper. Sovereign's a reaper, and reapers are AI. Yeah, they're like the oldest AI. They're a synthetic life, like and they're the in death. they're in like they're in like sleep mode in the dark realm. Yeah, and then sovereign basically it 
exists in our half of the universe to hit the wake up button. And in Mass Effect 1, you stop him. How do you blow him? How does it blow up? Oh, 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 during the big battle, right? So, so, uh, the end of the game is on Enos. E- Eos? Uh, Ilos. Ilos? I think. Yeah. Uh, that's where you talk to the ancient thing. Yep. Who might even be like a character that you meet in the future. I don't know. It's a hologram, right? It's a hologram, yeah. And it's basically like, here's the deal. It's a Prothean AI. It's a Prothean AI. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and like there were things before the Protheans, which is which is always fun. Uh, is like, are you gonna be the race of people that listens to the last race of people how to actually defeat the big bad? It's very Outer Wilds. Yeah, it yeah. kind of is. How uh, shame on Mass Effect for stealing that from Outer Wilds, uh, but. <laughs> Um. Yeah. So you race back to the Citadel because that's Saren's big ploy is to get so- to make Sovereign suck on the Citadel to open up the mass relay for the the Reapers to come on in. I love that plot point. That how the Citadel is it's planted self. by the Reapers. It's intended to be discovered and advance the the development of galactic civilization oh. around paths that they can predict. Uh huh. And the Citadel is, it's like, um, Cause the Reapers it's are the just, entry point for the Reapers. Yeah. The Reapers are just like resource devouring. Yeah, they're hungry for that biomass. Yeah. <laughs> the, way Sovereign, the way Sovereign's red face talked to me on his, no, wait, what did, what did I talk to Sovereign on? Was that a Vermeer Geth transporter? I believe it happens on Vermeer, like you yeah. said. Yeah. Yeah. Am I just in like Sovereign's big toe? I don't think you're on board, but okay. you're talking to him in a hologram thing. It's a very long scene. It's like a big plot reveal. Yeah. That's the first time you talk to Sovereign. Yeah, and you're like, why are you doing this? And it's like, we don't even know why we're doing it. What, what, does, Sov- what does Sovereign say? He's just real evil. Yeah, it's it's something along the lines of you couldn't even begin to comprehend. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that. And you know what? I kind of like that, but I also don't. So so uh yeah sovereign just just like a just like a fish just grabs onto the citadel even after the flower petal things close and it's like all right commander shepherd do you want to send your ship to like kill sovereign real good or to save the delegates the current council members yeah yeah and I definitely say it went and saved those council members. Nice. Untold political yada yada would have happened if I didn't do that. I did not want to go into Mass Effect 2 and being like, you didn't even come to our aid during the, <laughs> the Sovereign fight. The, this request will be denied. Well, it's I mean, motherfucking. Uh, full disclosure, if you don't come to their aid, they do die. Oh! Wiped out. Oh, but they get replaced with, with like equally lame stiffs right no no No? oh is that like and then that's why like oh cerberus had to take over because the council just what just disintegrated it's been a while so my virgin playthrough did have the deceased council um and i think you advance i thought it was consequential i thought it'd be like like a huge no it's it's consequential i'm just trying to remember how it plays out i think you get ambassador is his name amadala udina udina yeah udina think, is is sucks i think you get him on the council if you wipe the previous one. Oh well no you you can choose oh okay you get to it's like after after you save the council they're like hmm maybe humans are not that bad after all <laughs> okay who would you like to be the mascot on the council Udina or Keith David? Right. And you go, Keith David, because then he gets to say the final speech where it's like, wherever we are, we're humans. <laughs> I love Keith David. He does a He's great job. He's my favorite character in Saints Row the Third. Oh, really? He gets, well, you know, in Saints Row the Third, you are the president. Yeah. yeah. Now, you, now you know this. <laughs> and Keith David, as himself, right. is your uh chief of staff and goes 
Well, it's time to. What do you want to be the president you're remembered for? The one that cured cancer or ended world hunger? <laughs> that's the that's the fourth Saints Row game. Ah, oh, oh, what is, what happens in Saints Row the Third? I didn't play that one. The answer is good stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just don't. It introduced all the gamers to the Kanye song. Apparently, don't play the Saints Row reboot though. No, <laughs> this new Saints Row game is bad. The Saints Row franchise goes. Poor, poor, great, good, poor. Yeah, it's quite the narrative arc they yeah. they took. It's like Saw Metal Gear. Oh my! It it's close to the the Metal Gear bell shape. Got it. I don't know. It's <laughs> back to bat Mass Effect. Uh, blah 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 blah. Oh, oh, okay. So I fight my way to the council chambers, which is the the big pit where you talk to them for the first time. Uh, and Saren is there on his hoverboard. Yeah. And I and I like hide next to behind a pylon, and I'm like, "This doesn't have to end this way, Saren." And he's all like, uh, "You could have been the smarter one, Shepard, and helped me bring Sovereign here. They need you, smart humans." And and Mass Effect goes. That's just sovereign talking brain control, Sarah. And you know you've lost your will, and you don't even know it. And Saren's all like, ah, ah you. Uh, it's not too late. Yeah, you know, being like a good villain. Saren, Saren is the is like baseline good villain. I agree. Yeah, uh, big fan of Saren. I totally forgot about um, uh, Asari matriarch Venezia. Matriarch Venezia. Yeah. She was his yeah, sidekick. She was underdeveloped. For yeah, it's too too soon. Um, but then, hey, there's a special red and blue uh, dialogue option that for, you could say to Saren on his hoverboard. Yes, and, and the you've blue, learned your lesson from and, Vermeer. But I was not. Uh, I was not charismatic enough. Oh, or edgy enough. I had to choose a limp dick white option. I see. And what were the blue options? It was like persuade Saren. It's like. Or the red one is like, they'll betray you too. And, right. I think you need a maxed out charm or intimidate stat. And I just auto leveled up my 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 shepherd. Got it. So what happens when you persuade Sarah? And I wrote down that question mark and I didn't look it up. Oh, it's incredible. You You get through to him and he's like, you're right. It's too late for me, though. And then he pulls his gun on himself oh. and shoots himself in the head. Oh, and then he anamorphs into And si- then he and- still anamorphs, but you yeah. skip the whole hoverboard fight. Oh, I like that narratively. Yeah, you, you get through to Saren, convince him that he's being manipulated, and he commits suicide if you're that charming or edgy. Oh, that's a great way to do it. Isn't it great? Yeah. Super, I love that choice. All right, and then and then when he becomes Monster Mash, then you've got to fight him. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Which is it's it was still fun to be like he's like, oh, I'm actually sovereign in possessing him. Um, that's the point at which I, I load back into when I say like continue game after the credits. Oh, is oh, the man. is the Monster Mash fight? Something's messed up with your save. I don't remember having that issue. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, all goes well. The, the big ship blows up. Uh, what other side missions did I do? I don't know. I just, while I was at the Citadel, I like cleaned up a couple of things. Like the debt, like the politician whose sister was a pirate. Right. Um, didn't see any more Batarians. Uh, I definitely got tired of, of fighting just Geth. Yes, it is. I wanted to a kill weakness of the first game. Other things, and you'll you'll get that opportunity. Yeah, uh, there's much better enemy diversity in Mass Effect two and three. Yeah. Okay. Gosh, one side quest the the one for like the the medic lady, where she's getting extorted. She was, was first. She got extorted. Then you went into the club and met Rex. Right. That that was extortion number one. And then I think she got extorted again. By the same dudes, and then you had to like talk to the Volus merchant and scare away another guy, and then I was like, oh, "Let's see what's going on in Elos." And then I ended the game. Yeah, um, but yeah, and then you load up Mass Effect Two, and it's like, "Do you want your ME Pro tag?" And I go, "Yes, of course." And then it and it runs down all the things that you did or didn't do, 
Uh, and then, and then, uh, it's like another day for the Normandy sailing in the expanse of Citadel space. This what's, what's the, that big laser Normandy? This just, is the opening scene. Yeah. Just, and then Joker's like, I'm not, I'm going to go down with the ship because I love being a pilot. I'm such a good pilot. And Shepard literally has to like firemen's carry him out and throw him out the out the thing and then i liked the little comic that plays at the beginning of mass effect 2 do you know what i'm talking about yeah. or is that just just legendary edition it was dlc for the og games but it's included in legendary edition okay. right all right it's uh, to catch you up on the events of mass effect 1 right and I, yeah i liked it you know it was a good recap um uh and then and then you watch the most science fiction we brought you with with probably enough money to like to just make a million genophages uh they bring shepherd back to his like cold dead space where did he land like <laughs> what did he just he just rocket plummets down to some some like desolate planet and Martin Sheen is there with a dustpan to like sweep him up and take him to Cerberus Labs where they spend two years on like, the Lazarus Project like gluing yeah. his neurons back together Lazarus Project a great name I love I love Lazarus as a concept all the way back from the Batmans but uh real fun Miranda's cool uh, I'm, I'm already, I'm already talking to like Yeoman, that girl, I think her name, I think her name is like Yeoman. Yeoman Chambers? Is yeah, yeah, maybe. I'm already finger gunning her. Uh, <laughs> but, um, have yet to plot a course. All I did was, uh, pick my class, which I think was, I just picked soldier. Got it. I didn't want to have to deal with. With the Assassin's Creed Odyssey abilities that uh, engineer, what are, what are, what are all the abilities of Mass Effect Two? It's just yeah, they're sorry, didn't mean to yawn. Biotic. The different classes yeah. have different cooldown abilities and stuff. Steve Bloom as man with little hair in the tutorial of Mass Effect Two goes, "I gotta, I gotta charge him." And then you have to go in your UI and press a button, and then he like explodes with electricity and allows you to move some boxes to progress. So you remember? You definitely don't remember this. No. No, no, no. Oh, oh, Mass Effect One ending. <laughs> We're just skipping around. Sure. Um, Keith David, uh, what's Captain it? Anderson. Captain Anderson. Thank you. Uh, goes. I can. I can open. I can close the Citadel doors if I infiltrate Udina's office. Or you can have uh, my men storm the Citadel uh, sec deck. What's C sec? C sec. It's just off, short like, for Citadel security. Yeah, you can, or you can basically just bust into like the police office. And was this when you were landlocked on the Citadel? Yeah, and you're trying to escape yes. so that you can do your final mission. Right. Yeah. Uh, I chose. I chose. Captain Anderson to take matters into his own hands and he cold cocks Udina. Like, right. Yeah. yeah. Who's just like, uh, you're <laughs> not supposed to be in this. So I'm, oh, and then he gets knocked, just KO. And uh that was that was uh, that was the funnest way to do it. I I wouldn't have chose the other option, uh, because it likely wouldn't have been as fun as that. But um No, I'm guessing that was the last thing of Mass Effect One. I'm guessing the answer is no, since we've made it this far without it being broached. What? But did you initiate a romance in Mass Effect One? No. No. Well, because my whole what were my options was um, Blue Girl, Liara, and Ashley. I think are the only options. Okay. Very limited in Mass Effect One. Yeah. Mass Effect Two and Three, the world's your oyster. <laughs> Everyone will date Commander Shepard. Uh, I didn't. I didn't even touch Liara. Uh, did, did, what? You didn't recruit her? Or no, what? no, okay. I recruited her. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't think you. I, I don't think you. Can yeah, she's mandatory. Not recruit her. Um, I mean, yeah, we're sharing memories, but I, that don't mean nothing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, she's just like, oh, I gotta sit down. Uh, you, you're, Commander Shepard, your brain is so strong. Uh, no, because I'm going with on every mission with Rex, 
And I've already like developed a rapport with Ashley. So the second slot is either her or it's Garrus. I don't, I don't really care for Tali, even though she's the first person you, your friendly face in Mass Effect Two. Right. And yes. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, getting the group we're getting back the together. game back together because she's the one that's like, where are they now? It's for everybody. Um. So I was happy to see her then, but in Mass Effect One, no, she's just kind of there. And also, like, I kind of needed like the f- I didn't really care for the 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 tech tree stuff that those teammates offered got it um if anything was gonna happen it was gonna be me and ashley but i needed to have like and it might have happened had i continued my save at a place where i might have been able to continue oh okay and jump into some side missions with her and then i like i haven't even the way you do it is by like going to their quarters and like doing special dialogue options i think if you've talked to them enough over the course of the game you'll have the option to uh, lock in this romance uh, right before you initiate the final mission. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. How do you feel about working with Cerberus in Mass Effect 2? I mean, they they are just... Oh, what did I call them? <laughs> the mid-game. They're just... Um, they're like... They're like Fox... What uh what's Metal Gear's secret like guns of the Patriots? What are they called? Ooh, I'm the wrong person to yeah, ask. Yeah, but like you know how Metal Gear is just these extra paramilitary, like we're doing what's right for the world to like end the fight peacefully and we're like anti nuke. Yeah. Um Diamond Dogs are in, in Phantom Pain, but what are they're like Sons of the Patriots, the Lale Lule Lo <laughs> I'm just saying uh, ma- Metal Gear buzzwords, but yeah. that's what Cerberus is. They're like, they're a pro-human, just these, just like this kind of like CIA type. Yeah, like an independent military contractor. Which is always like the best way to go in space. In space, okay. Yeah, it's like, it's like, um, it's like the British East India Company. Yeah, except they're... The British East India Company was very British, though, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't know. I just it's like these these companies that are kind of like owned and operated in in the wild west that is outer space. Sure. Uh, why is Cerberus should should Cerberus be tipping off any red flags? I mean, you do. They were a recycled. Uh, enemy in Mass Effect 1, you'd have to like burst into some Cerberus labs and oh, mess stuff up. Oh, that's Cerberus? They crop up a few times, yeah. I I laid waste. I've already like you've, talked about raiding some of their labs. You've presumably shot up some Cerberus folks in Mass Effect some 1. Some staff members? Yeah. Jacob's buddy from from station 12 potentially just blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah um uh i it that hasn't hit me narratively enough okay well to be continued yeah i'm just i'm i'm just happy to be alive yeah it's it's a little you need some suspension of disbelief, but I I love the the balls of Bioware just killing Commander Shepard well, on the they, the onset of Mass Effect Two because they needed the two year gap. They so also, either you freeze him or you turn him into like a bionicle that you have to put back together. I also appreciate how it's narrative justification for resetting resetting your level and all oh, your skills. Oh yeah, okay. Which, um, when you hit Mass Effect 3, and spoiler, they don't immediately kill (laughs) Commander Shepard again, Mm. you retain your skills from Mass Effect 2. And they've just lengthened the the skill curve. Oh, so I should really learn to like Mass Effect 2's, like, combat, and and I should Dark Souls it. Yeah, it kind of picks up where you leave off in Mass Effect 3, which... I think was pretty novel that's, for a game to do. Yeah, that's that's probably for the best. And Great. Yeah. 
this has been thrilling for me to hear all your thoughts. I'm glad. I'm yeah. glad the Rex scene was so impactful for you. It, I almost when they pull when they first pull guns on each other and it's just that screen with the dialogue box in the center. That's that's probably like my that's what I'll always remember Mass Effect One as being peak Mass Effect. Yeah, and that's a great choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fantastic. So you feel, I mean, in between Outer Wilds, 13 Sentinels, how encouraged do you feel to continue playing Mass Effect? Well, like, does, is the Grand uh, Asari Matriarch, she's still there, right? Matriarch the Citadel? Benezi? Or which no, one? No, no. What's like, who's like the Asari chick that you, it takes forever to schedule an appointment with? Oh. Uh, she's at the Citadel, yeah. Okay, she's still, like, able to, like, tell your fortune and stuff? I believe so. Okay. She's not as important as maybe you're making her out to be. Oh, darn. I kind of wanted... I mean, she she piqued my interest. Okay. Oh, I... But I didn't... It didn't... I didn't finish that thread in Mass Effect 1. Got it. So. Uh, what, but, but what's the temperature compared to other games? Um... Oh, now I, I just got to knock out. <laughs> I got to. I need to play 13 Sentinels in Under Cover of Darkness. And then. Uh, oh, it, it's it's looking rough. What, what other game is coming out? Persona? Persona 5 comes out in October. Oh, my God. <laughs> For the PC. And I said I would do it with you. <laughs> I mean, I won't be playing it at launch. Because you'll be too busy. I've got I've got tons of stuff to play. Okay. Right. Some of which I'll be talking about very soon. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, why don't we get into that? Sure. All right, cool. Transitioning out of Mass Effect, I've been playing only one game. And here's what I'll here's my lead into it. Every year I feel like there's some small kind of under the radar game that releases one or two per year that I know nothing about prior to its release. And then it comes out of nowhere and releases to huge critical acclaim. It, it blows up. Critics eat it all up. And there was no hype train leading up to it. 2019, I think you could say that was Disco Elysium yeah. or maybe Outer Wilds. I didn't know anything about those games until suddenly they were getting perfect review scores. Um, in 2020, I think it was 13 Sentinels. I had no idea that game was on, on being worked on. And in 2021, it was Inscription. Had no idea Inscription was oh, yeah. going to be a thing. And then in the fall, it came out, and it was the indie darling of the year. There was one other game in 2021 that I feel falls into this category, and that's what I'm playing right now. It's a little gem called Wildermyth. Uh. All right, so let me, let's talk about Wildermyth. This is a tactical rpg game available i'm playing it on steam and so far i have to say oh, yeah. i've been very impressed with it um i'm not super deep i think i've put about six hours in now what i have to say so far this is Heath, isometric darkest dungeon yeah it's it's in the vein of a fire emblem it is grid-based tactical combat with a party of heroes going on an adventure. This is a very standard setup to a bunch of games. But like I was saying, this requires more investigation because currently I can't say whether I'm impressed due to sleight of hand or if the game really is magical. And all right, here's, here's what the game is. Here's the pitch. This game is trying, is maybe... More so than any game I've played, it's taking an, an earnest, genuine stab at compelling, procedurally generated storytelling. To the extent it is trying to mimic the experience players would have during a tabletop role-playing session, ah. um, where the game is taking on the role of the dungeon master or game master and trying to tell you a story that can go wherever your imagination takes you. Um, it's super flexible. And I think the developers put all their eggs in this basket because it compromises in a lot of other areas. You pulled up some screenshots. You can see that the game's aesthetic is um, 
it's kind of flash games art it's, looking. It's like uh um it's a little Microsoft Paint. What's the What's the quilted uh, game that 1v1 that I'm really good at? Patchwork. patchwork. It's very patchwork. Yeah, it's it's not a looker. Is this guy headless? <laughs> Let's zoom in. No, oh, no, he's just head. leaning in. Yeah, the the aesthetic isn't super impressive. I mean, I don't need to harp on it, but well, neither is Darkest Dungeon. Oh, Darkest Dungeon has style. Never it's, mind. It's so it's the best looking game. It's so grim and when you look at Darkest Dungeon, you know it's from that game. Yeah, but it's still like kind of cardboard cutout flashy. Yeah, this is this when you're in combat, this game looks like a diorama. Trust me, this but a, a w- somewhat myth, generic it? diorama. Yeah. But the flexibility of its r- rather limited aesthetic that affords the developers the fact that characters are entirely customizable. Like you can tweak them to a ridiculous degree from their appearance to their personality types to their uh, backstories. Infinite variety with the character design which is commendable for a game that's trying to tell infinite stories potentially. So what do you how do you spend your time in Wildermyth and how is it so how is why has it been impressing me so much? Um the foundation of Wildermyth is a rock solid tactics game. It's not trying to reinvent the book with its combat. Um if you've played a Fire Emblem game or a or a Into the Breach, you you know what you're getting into here. It is characters moving around on an orthogonal grid. Uh, you have a limited number of actions. Oftentimes, you're going to spend your turns moving, attacking enemies in range, trying to set up some synergy between your party members. Uh, it's standard fantasy fare. You know, you've got your warrior, your rogue, your mage, and yeah, they've got special abilities. You develop them as they level up. So far, so video games, right? right. Um, that is not the impressive part. Um, I will call the combat uh, satisfying. It doesn't bore me. It's a good amount of challenge with v- a variety of difficulty scaling that you can do. Um, and the enemies are diverse. So, yeah, a solid, if not wowing, combat system. Now let's get into the magical part. And that's the, what happens in between combat. Um, so this is where the game's dynamic storytelling happens. Very frequently, maybe two or three times between missions, you are going to get hit with some story choices that the game presents you with, and wow, they're consequential. And wow, they don't feel like they're scripted. Um, They're kind of being plucked from, I assume, this vast vault of possibilities that the game, that the developers have crammed into the game that you will see a tiny fraction of on every playthrough that will make your story personal. So let's let's talk about my uh, misfit clan of adventurers, of which I have this core cast of four, but um, as it goes on, this is telling a story over a grand amount of time. I think between every chapter of the game, of which I'm in chapter three right now, there is like a 10-year gap, and your party ages up Whoa. and gets older and advances. What is it, Sifu? Kind of your your characters, your party will eventually retire, so you need to be recruiting new members along the way so that you don't have all the you want the seasoned veterans, but you need to be replenishing the young bucks oh. so that as the <laughs> pyre as the years go on and your your old uh, favorites are aging out of the adventuring game or die prematurely because that's something that can happen. Um, you need replacements for them to keep your story going, your legacy going. Uh, let me just pull up my screenshot here. Yeah, I had this original trio, and you get to define the relationships between them. I had uh, Taldian, my warrior, um, Lustel, the slightly older, more cynical friend. He was my my rogue, my archer. And then Violet, the mage. This is the core trio I started with that I customize a little bit. I, I basically just hit randomize until I found people like resonated with me, which the game, it'll t- uh, it customizes their appearance and their, their emotional disposition. And then you can kind of 
you get to steer how the relationships develop. So I tried to hook up Taldian and Violet as a romantic duo, where um, then the, the two male leads were like chummy friends, and I tried to put a rival tension between Lustel and Violet. Why? Oh. Just... I just thought that would be a fun dynamic. Ugh. We've got the, the buddies, the lovers, and then the, the last relationship is the, the rivalry tension where they, they butt heads. Uh-huh. Um, so that was my initial trio setup, and they all just start out as vanilla characters, but, you know, I go on a couple missions, and suddenly, Violet has contracted lycanthropy. She's turning into a wolf in uh-huh. my story, um, slowly but surely. Um, she's starting, like, she has a wolf head, and by the time I hit chapter two and ten years have gone by, she's fully wolf. Uh-huh. But I'm trying to keep that romance alive, despite <laughs> the fact that she's very hairy now. Mm. What else is going on? Oh, then there's, it's also funny how the opportunities you seemingly turn down can develop in unexpected ways. So Lustel, he fell down this cave cavern and found this altar that seemed ominous. It was glowing. There's like this percentage chance the game asks you if you want to like interact with this altar. And I don't know how that's going to develop. The uh, possibilities are maybe endless, but I'm just like, you know, I don't think Lustel would do that. So he backs away and you get rewarded for that too. Even though you turn down the fun story shenanigans, uh-huh. apparently he got this uh, lifetime buff to his luck stat. Uh, for apparently not flirting with nefarious powers that be with that altar. Oh. So you get rewarded even if you choose the quote-unquote boring option. Taldian is maybe the most interesting. So I had this personal quest pop up for him that you could pursue to embark on or not. Um, he had this, this ceremonial dagger passed down through his family. And I don't feel bad spoiling these story beats because there's a very high chance they don't crop up in your playthrough of Wildermyth. They're very personalized. Right. So this dagger, it's got some bad juju, but it's this uh, familial relic in Taldian. It's in his possession now. He can embark on a personal quest to return to the forge that made this dagger and cast it back into the flames, very Lord of the Ringsy, and get rid of it. And his lover, Violet, who's half wolf at wolf at this point, she wants to help him see it through. Um, so I decide to take a detour from our current quest objective, go to this altar, dispose of this dagger. Um, you fight the ghost of like the guy who Wait, cause forged you, the dagger. Because you can't just drop the dagger where you are and just keep walking. No, right? no, no, no. It's um the juju will the, hang over Taldian. Right, okay. Um but Taldian is the continent? Is the character who owns oh, the dagger. Oh, that's the dad, yeah, that's the boy. The my warrior class guy. So we go to the the forge. We fight the ghost. Fight the ghost presented with the ability to dispose of the dagger or you can keep it apparently. And then it shows you the dagger's stats. And I'm like, ho, ho, ho. But you didn't know the dagger stats until then? I did not. That's part of the juju. I I guess it wasn't an unlockable item. But now it's equipable, and you can choose oh. to keep it. And that sounds interesting. So I keep the dagger. I go with that that route. But Violet, Violet turned that, off by that. That sours relations with Violet. She thought he wasn't, uh, Taldian was no longer being true to himself. Ah. Oh. But, oh, you know what actually happened? In addition to seeing the stats, Taldian was also granted a vision of all the good he could potentially do wielding the dagger with its power. And so I say, you know, why not keep it? Uh-huh. And things are things are normal. Until I hit chapter two and find out what Taldian's been up to in the, pat- in the 10-year interstitial. Oh. And the dagger has... It's turned him into a skeleton. Uh, Taldian's undead now. Um, his retirement age is like in the thousands. So Taldian, he's going to be a permanent fixture of my party, presumably, um, because he'll never age out. But as far as relationships go with everyone in the party, they've all been adjusted to everyone hates Taldian and the feelings are mutual. So uh, his romance is dead which I didn't plan for. I thought they could be a cute couple. There's a wolf girl and a skeleton boy, but not to be apparently. And now I didn't see it coming, but 
those initial rivals, Lustel and Violet, they've they've sparked a new romance in era three. Ooh. Now that they're in their forties, their twilight years, there's a uh, some sparks flying. Didn't foresee that coming, but that's just the organic way my storyline's developing. How do I win? Oh yeah. How do you win? So talk about It's like it, into the breach. Talk, you gotta go to the final gate. I haven't I need to play more. I'm not done with my campaign. Talk about a treasure trove of content. When you boot up the main menu, there's like a dozen different campaigns to play. Uh, I'm only in the very first one. I'm on to technically tutorial island, you can call it. It's a tutorial campaign. Yeah. And um I have to just like stop the Gorgon threat. Yeah. Um, I don't know how that's going to play out. I've got children of some of my early party members that's joining the crew. Oh my! How many times do we chuckle at murder trivia party treating the next round's players as as the, the descendants? That will that that will that's always so fun. So I've got multiple generations aboard the party now. Um, you killed my father. And the the one mechanical thing I wasn't expecting to enjoy the rhythm game (laughs) it's almost a resource management game yeah you have to manage your time Uh, Um, so when you're in a chapter between the battles well that's just darkest this is just darkest dungeon oh really i haven't played darkest Dungeon. lamp life yeah in between the battles you get to choose how your adventures adventurers spend their time so there's persona (laughs) but uh, not that granular there will be various threats cropping up on the overworld map. You choose which of your adventures are you sending where and mm-hmm. to do what. You have to account for travel time. And um, you can spend time scouting out certain regions and setting up outposts, which will... And here's the part where I'm like, my max minning brain enjoys. If you, the When you set up more and more outposts, you will generate resources between chapters you get a payday which you can use now it's frostpunk which you can use to craft better and better gear on the future chapters dynamic threats will appear that will like try to monster roving bands of monsters will destroy your outposts unless you you disperse adventures to stop the the threat and you're uh, managing time the reason you want to be efficient is that the longer you allow time to progress in the overworld without finishing the chapter the more buffs enemies will receive yeah Um, so there's this card system where certain classes of enemies as time elapses get better and better stats and new abilities and the longer you take the more challenging they'll become i love that it's a good mechanic that you you can't just (laughs) quote unquote grind and grind and get better what's um remember bad north oh it's was it called bad north yeah yeah, yeah. okay you, yeah i do if you if you take too long it the the rough waves catch up to you and you're dead got it this is a much better system i do like it i like the bad guys get too strong yeah so there's just there's tons of fun choices both you inside play, and outside of combat. You ever play Pokemon Mystery Dungeon? I have not. It'll say like if you take if you loiter in a dungeon too long, it'll say that there's something coming towards you, and then and then it'll just whisk you away. Got like, it. It just kicks you out the dungeon. So suffice to say, I've been super impressed with my six hours in Wildermyth. The game's six hours, and you don't even see the the end in sight. <laughs> I don't. But you're you're only like still the first campaign. Yeah, I'm in my first campaign. Ooh, okay, well, okay, all right, I believe that. Yeah, I've been super impressed with the game's dynamism. What did um, you just say? Dynamism, the the quality of being dynamic. Ah, uh. it really does feel like I'm having this custom storytelling experience told to me. We've talked about this is what you wanted from Hades. No. I feel like the last time this conversation topic came up, it was when I was playing something like Middle Earth Shadow of War. Ah, uh, yeah. With yeah. Uh, my own custom cast of orc rivals and friends and adversaries, the uh, the randomly generated orcs and the the fun interactions we have. We've talked about, oh man, when will a procedurally generated story rival a custom author? Oh, and we have our answer. And I, it's I, like fifty episodes later. 
Yeah, I mean, this is maybe the best attempt at it so far. And what I what I really need to do before I can put the ironclad Chris stamp of approval of this game Ooh. is I need to finish my campaign, start up a new one, and see if the magic is real. Mm. Like, how much content is here to support the endless possibilities? Yeah. Will I have another character turn into a wolf in my next campaign? Then I'd be seeing behind the curtain, yeah. and then the illusion would be shattered to but some if, extent. But if she turned into a snake... Then, game of the year. Game of the year. Wonder Myth. And that's that's Wilder Myth. There will oh, be it's just I ruined it. Anyway. There will be future updates for, on the show for coming from me. Um I'm shocked that this wasn't Yakuza. Well, what do you mean? <laughs> I that thought, I that we can finally go an episode without talking about Yakuza. I thought you were gonna talk about Yakuza. Oh no. Oh, that's coming. Maybe in uh, the taste portion. Who knows? <laughs> All right, that was a lengthy games Woo. we've been playing section. Woo. Loved it. Why don't we take a break and have a? Do you want to do? Do you want to do some news? Or yeah. You, what up? Okay. Cool. There, there's been a lot of news. To be fair, let's talk to you soon. Welcome back. And we're back. Surprisingly jam-packed news week, huh, Heath? Agreed. I felt well catered to. Are you talking about the Nintendo? I'm talking about all the Nintendo and all the Sony announcements. Yeah. What's the abbreviation for the new Zelda? Tears of... Tot K? Tears of the Kingdom. Is is there just talk, right? T-O-T-K? T-O-T-K. Oh, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Do you know how ubiquitous B O T W was? Did I say R- o- ubiquitous? Yeah, U- ubiquitous. ubiquitous. Thank you, you. You used the right word. Right, sorry. Uh, but yeah, now we're not. Now they, they didn't pronounce it in the trailer. It could be Tears of the Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. <laughs> what is Tears? Whoa. <laughs> But I don't know where to go from there. Yeah, I, there's not really a follow up, is there? So what? Yeah, what are you jazzed about? Now I'm I'm guessing you did not. Did you want? Did you like get the, all the highlights of the Nintendo Direct? Do you know? All, yeah. Do you have you? I just s- mentioned the last thing. Well, yeah, I'm not, everyone knows about that. Have, are you briefed on all the farming on simulators? What the, oh yeah, the farming sims. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah, story yeah. of seasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man. I saw a, a God of you, Farming parody for God of War. Did you see the best title of the show? The game announced that was called Various Daylight. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah, was yeah. so good. That's a that's a uh, Octopath spinoff, right? I think it's just, I don't even, I think the game might have Various released Daylife. already and has been panned and it's just being ported to the Switch. It's just Job Simulator it in like, seemed- like a Final Fantasy ty- uh, context. It seemed so uncompelling, and then when they revealed the title, I'm like, this is a perfect fit. Nailed the title. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about games we actually enjoyed to hear about. So, Breath of, the, Breath of the Wild 2 has a title, we said that, and a release date. Were you surprised by the May release date? Uh, I mean, when did... Breath of the Wild came out two years ago for me, so I can't be surprised. On your own personal timeline. Will you be able to finish Breath of the Wild in time? I own Breath of the Wild. So you stand a chance. I stand a chance. But I also own, like, Prey 2017. Yeah, owning is not necessarily any guarantee. (laughs) I want to play that one. There's so much to play, dude. Yeah, I was pleasantly surprised it's a May release. I believe they'll hit it. I don't think it'll suffer a further delay. And yeah, the, the gameplay they showed was somewhat brief, but... See the the time mechanic, the rewind, the tracer ability. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know that's like the big. That's the new the new uh, ability. Sheikah slate thing. Fun. 
Yeah, that sounds very, very dynamic. Um, we'll we'll love it when we see. Broadly it. applicable. I mean, it's a ten- if we were doing a fantasy th- something something, we'd each be vying for its uh, uh, publishing rights. Right, that, very much so. Yeah, it almost seems too easy. Yeah. Um, my most exciting announcement of the Nintendo Direct was Fire Emblem Engage, which is a port. It's a it's a brand new mainline Fire Emblem. It's a brand. Game. It's a sequel to Three Houses. Well, as far as I'm concerned, yeah, it's it's the next follow up to Three Houses. Doesn't seem to be featuring any of the characters or crossover. No. I'm I'm a newly minted Fire Emblem fan, so this will be my second one. I'm super pumped. It does seem a little fan servicey because, like, there's it's featured in the trailer that you can Is summon Marth. There, you can summon Marth. Okay, and other protagonists across the series. All the Smash, all of them, monsters. I am pretty much unfamiliar with. So that Corin, that part of its appeal is somewhat lost on me. Um, Robin, the, the the protagonist's red and blue hair seems. <laughs> I saw me. S- seems so. Like bubblegum, I don't know, candy. I don't like it. It's Japan. I guess. Japan loves it. It's just it reminds me of like candy or like the the twist ice cream cone yeah. flavors where you're just doing shenanigans. Yeah. I it seems so artificial. Uh. But I can look past that for some cool tactical combat. Yeah. And then the there's the Octopath Traveler too. Looking good. But the the under and we're the not talking about Project Triangle strategy. Uh no, because that's out. Yeah. But that's that's Octopath Traveler too. What do you mean? In my in my head canon. Oh. Uh well here's the actual Octopath Traveler too. That was okay. announced. Oh good. But the, the surprise pick of the show that was exciting to me was uh Rain Code. This is uh, the spiritual successor to Danganronpa. Yeah. Um, by the series creator. And it has a bear. Probably. It definitely has the, the analogous feature of the court trials. Uh-huh. So because you play as a detective, you're solving murder cases. It looks like you gather clues, and then you you present them at a, at a trial. And it's going to be great. It has the Danganronpa aesthetic. I'm going to be so here for it. Because it's been so long. It was 2017 the last time we got a Danganronpa game. And I can still buy that that pack full of all three Danganronpas, oh, right. right? Yeah, there's a collection. I haven't been spoiled on any Dangan. <laughs> Good. I mean, they're, they're somewhat niche games, so I don't know who would be spoiling them for you. Yeah, you. Yeah, me. Um, so that was my surprise. Rain Code. Yes. So this is becoming the Rain series? Are the you, Code series? Yeah, it's a, a new franchise, but it looks heavily influenced by Danganronpa. Mm. Uh, you play as a detective, which Danganronpa is known for featuring lots of detectives in it. Uh-huh. And so in addition to feeling very well taken care of by Nintendo, I couldn't believe it when I woke up the very next day and saw there were not one, not two, but three Yakuza announcements. Yeah. Wow, I'm a kid in a candy store. That's Sega, man. We've got the next the next one, Yakuza 8, Like a Dragon 8, I think is the actual title. It's called Like a Dragon 8? Yes. There's only one Like a Dragon game. So the reason this makes sense is that the name of the franchise in Japan is Like a Dragon. Oh, thank you. I forgot about that. It's a Resident Evil biohazard situation. That's, that's fun. So that's how that makes sense. Yeah. And wow, we've got Ichiban and Kiryu, both protagonists. Oh, well, I mean, Kiryu was in Like a Dragon. I felt like they'd never bring him back. As a summon. Right. But um, he's, he's going to be back in the driver's seat, I guess. Yeah. That's exciting. Is, are all the images I'm seeing of him and that haircut real? Ichiban? No, yeah, Kiryu's new hair, haircut. I'm n- he looks like a silver fox or something. <laughs> Type in Kiryu haircut with uh, like a dragon eight or something. Yeah. Okay. Like uh, Jesus Christ. (laughs) 
Oh, that? Is that real? Oh, I hope not. That kind of... The, oh, I kind of like being in this limbo in between. I'm not sure, so I haven't watched the trailer to find. I out. mean, I know Ichiban's forty. Oh, he is. Yeah, okay. he was one of like the oldest protagonists imaginable. I believe in this point in the timeline, Kyrio's canonically in his fifties <laughs> or flirting. Yeah, with but 60s. I like I like Kiryu as this ageless Mario type. Yeah. So I'm going to go out on the limb and say that's his that's his haircut in the game. I mean, it won't look nearly as bad in the game as you're doing it. Like you'll get habituated to it instantly, I'm sure. but but like, hmm. But yeah, that that's just one of the three new games we are getting that port. Wait, what did you na- Okay, you named Like a Dragon 8. eight. We're getting Yakuza Ishin or yeah, Ishin. What's it closest to? It is a spin-off that only released in Japan. We're finally getting it in the West. It is a wacky historical like samurai story. Oh, it's a period piece. Period piece being told with the character models of Yakuza. Using they're, they're in playing new, characters. I don't know how it works so exactly. Majima's model is going to be called like He will not be referred to Emperor as Majima. Hirohito. Basically, yeah. That's cool. Isn't it funky? Yeah. This is kind of like Using A list actors to play Marie Antoinette. Like, yes. The, the Akaza cast has been so well defined and it's so robust and that you, they are re- reprising their roles. They're, a pl- they're for- like slapping the archetypes on the historical figures as like a this is how to get the kids into our nation's history. Right. Uh, two thumbs up from me. Isn't I hope that... it. I hope it lands. Ishin. Yeah, Ishin. All right. Um, and they're remastering it, so it's going to look nicer. And then, last but not least, oh, it's already been out. Yes. Wait, but without the models. It's been out in Japan forever. It's never been localized in the West. Uh huh. So to play it, you would need to know Japanese. I don't. Me neither. But you don't have to anymore. Yeah. yeah. We they saved you thousands of hours of studying. Thank you. Thank you, Sega. And the last one is maybe the the weirdest. It's a new game. It's an interstitial Kiryu chapter. Um, I think it maybe tells you what Kiryu was up to in between the events of like Yakuza six and seven. It's called like the man who erased his name or something. That's the subtitle. And and you're jazzed to play it. Oh yeah, I'm jazzed to play it after I cover the six Yakuza games in between where I am and where it is. Yeah. And then the next day, Steam Stealth released both Judgment games on PC. Uh, Judgment and Lost Judgment. And I am just swimming in Yakuza content. Now, the Judgment games are Yakuza games, but they don't have Kiryu and they don't have Majima. Right. They are spinoff detective games, and their link is that they take place in the exact same city. In uh, Tokyo. In uh, Kamurocho. Kamurocho. And maybe Sotenbori. I assume you go there. Uh-huh. Um, so, yeah, you wander the same streets, presumably the same stores you can go into. There will probably be Easter eggs where you see some characters overlap. Uh-huh. Okay. But um, they are probably— But it's modern day. It's not the 80s. Uh, right. I mean, the only game in the 80s is Yakuza 0. The rest of them are, like, present day? Uh, Yakuza 1 jumps you all the way up to, like, 2005. Yeah. And then, yeah, I think some might be flirting with modern day by now. Not, I've got Oof. my work cut out for me, Heath. They are producing these AAA video games faster than I can play them. Put and I don't know fandom where your thumb yeah, is. How, do they, how are they doing that? These are long-ass games. It just made... I'm, I mean, not having to remake Camarocho's right. streets. They've practically got it down to an assembly line. <laughs> but it's all high-quality shit. Yeah. It's so good. Whew. That's all the news that's had me hyped over the past week. But I don't need to steal the show, Heath. Was there anything I failed to touch on that you like? Um, no. You, okay. Everything I like, you touched on. Very cool. Is that, is that fair to say? 
Oh, Ubisoft, um, Assassin's Creed Mirage. Right. Isn't that that? That's the they're going Prince of Persia. Kind of back to their roots. It's, it looks like the Middle East. Assassin's again. Creed was always like the answer to where is Prince of Persia. Right. Yeah. It's kind. It kind of killed that franchise. Yeah. They're going. They are going back to the roots. Now let's elaborate on this a little bit more. Uh, Assassin's Creed has been dead to us since. Well, you actually Odyssey. It is kind of dead to me, but only due to business reasons. They stopped releasing them on Steam. Oh. Assassin's Creed Valhalla is an epic game store exclusive. Yeah. And I cringe every time I hear it. Um, I think it's also on Ubisoft's proprietary Uplay yeah. store. But yeah, that makes that uh, dampens my enthusiasm. Did you hear the r- most recent joke where it's like, why did. Um, why did. Somebody was. <laughs> they, they were like. Why did Valhalla take so long to develop? Because they couldn't figure out a way for ships to climb a tower. <laughs> you know, the, the Assassin's Creed towers that are the synchronized points. Yes. Because that's the formula. The UB formula. Oh, yeah. Is, is get to the tower, reveal the map. The UB in Ubisoft stands for Ubiquitous Towers. Yeah, All their games good. have it. Far Cry has right. it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, why Valhalla specifically? Because they have uh, cause, Viking cause long the ships. ships. Yeah. But I mean, Odyssey was full of Greek ships. And Black Flag. And yeah. Black Flag. Uh, something doesn't connect there. All right. Sorry. All right. Well, your joke didn't land. Well, and that's why it's not in the episode. You didn't hear it. <laughs> Sorry, the what I tried to announce was did you hear about this Assassin's Creed platform? This servicey thing? It, it's called Assassin's Creed Infinite, I believe. No. Which will receive big meaty content updates of which Assassin's Creed Mirage will be the first. Oh, they're just they're just gassing Odyssey. I I don't know enough details, but it, it seems it's gas. It, yeah, probably. It seems it's going like to be like Hitman missions. Yes. Hitman seems like the point of comparison. They have this platform that will be a pipeline. We got a new fort. A pipeline to feed you more S- AC side content. Side missions in this fort. But it's VIPs be, to get. Yeah. But they've already announced the second one as well, which will be in Japan. Yay! We've come full circle. Like every every playground, like where should where should it be set next? You know. Yeah, it's long been requested to have an AC game in Japan since we've been in, in like middle school. Long before Ghost of Tsushima existed. Back when I would put a white blanket over my head and <laughs> pretend it to be like a hood, and then tape a spoon to my wrist to be a hidden blade. And go up to my brother and go. <laughs> I don't believe for a second you did that. <laughs> don't tell me you have photographic evidence. Oh, uh, yeah. what are you about to whip out to show me here? There's no way. Oh, I don't believe I that you did this, and I much less believe that you documented it. Twenty ten, like at age fifteen, I would have done it. I appreciate a man of passion. And it seemed like at the time you loved <laughs> Assassin's Creed. Um, Heath, yep. I've got something to tell you. What? I've got to go. Oh, darn. Uh, we've Sorry, folks. We've been teasing this taste discussion topic. Sorry, 6.30. We're, we will return to it. Yeah, you're late for... Wait, you got to go to uh, Maria's. I've got to... There's a scheduled family dinner. There's a Mexican something, something. It's at my house. It's nothing Mexican. Okay. But We're going to drive in the same direction. That'll be so fun. So if, if you are lying and you're not going to... Wait, no. No, your dinner... Family dinner is that way. Never mind. All right. We but, have to cut this. We have to end this now. Yeah. So entering closing statements. 
This has been Mobius Tubes, episode 75. Uh, if you want to write in uh, to ask Chris what he's having for dinner, you can write in at MobiusTubesPodcast at gmail.com. You certainly can. We'll read every email. And look forward to episode 76, where we will dive into discussing some of our video gaming tastes. I feel like I'm in that David Bowie interview. Uh, yeah, we will. I have my top five slash four. Yeah, we'll do five. Okay, five. Okay, That's a better rounder number. Uh, Chris, it's been a pleasure. Keith, it's been a... An honor. Uh, Get on the road. All right. See ya. Bye.